Welcome to Create Your Vibrant Life podcast. This is your host, Padma Ali. Today, I have a very, very dynamic guest, Sarah Intonato. Sarah, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. You are so dynamic is the right word for you. Thank you. So share, share with us what you do and who you are and tell us anything that you would like to share with us about who, what you, who you are. Sure. I live in Long Island, New York with my husband and my two children. I have been a devoted yoga practitioner and teacher for nearly 20 years. And I believe, of course, the universe nudges your path and moves it in directions that you could never predict, but are always perfect. And that certainly is part of my journey. I became a parent in 2010 and my oldest, who is now 11, was diagnosed on the autism spectrum when he was two years old. His name is Rocco and he's a brilliant child. And my daughter Aurelia is nine years old as well. So I had a yoga teaching business. I was thriving. I was confident. I felt great. And then it sort of felt like when you cut the steering wheel all the way in one direction and your car spins around and all of a sudden you stop and you think, well, well, wait, where am I now? What just happened? Where am I going? What am I doing? Am I okay? And that was very much like what my child's diagnosis felt like. It was not part of my plan. Mm -hmm. I'm a recovering overachiever, a recovering perfectionist. Yoga had helped me tremendously with those habits that did not serve me. And then when I became a parent to a unique child, it was time to learn it again in a different way. So of course, this influenced my yoga teaching business and how I work with my yoga students and also the yoga teachers and healers who I coach in their businesses. But in recent years, the universe nudged me again and said, it's time for you now to lead and support parents of unique children whatever term you like to use, special needs, neurodiverse, dis developmentally disabled, et cetera. I don't subscribe to any one label in particular, but I did find that I was feeling called and called to help this audience. So I'm in the process of finishing my first book, a spiritual guidebook for special needs parents. I am in the process of growing my business, which is a consulting practice for autism families and helping them thrive and advocate for their children so that they can use autism and this uniqueness to change the world instead of becoming victimized by what to me is a very broken system of supporting or not really supporting these very unique beings. So I still find that my yogic path is a daily part of my life. It's a part of my yoga practice, certainly. For my own well-being. It's a part of my work that I love, but I'm seeing my work with these families grow and grow because it's incredibly needed in the world. So that's me in a nutshell. And I also find because I have one child who is unique and different and one child who is developmentally very advanced and emotionally mature and on paper, very easy to read and looks good. So I have those very unique parenting experiences and I find that there are more similarities than there are differences between them. So I'm sure that whatever we highlight on today will benefit the listeners, whether their child is different and learns differently or is by the book, straight and narrow. So I have faith that people will hear whatever they need to hear and it will help them however it's supposed to help them. I love that, Sarah. I really love that. I love that you have the experience of, of, of being a parent to both types of children. And I love what you said, like a unique being. And that is such a beautiful term. And they are so unique. And you're absolutely right, because people are going to take from this whatever applies to their life. And a lot of my listeners and my clients tend, tend to be overachievers, high performers, very, you know, very type A, that's how they come in when they start working with me. And they all generally tend to be parents as well. So you've somehow merged all these different worlds together. So tell us a little bit about how, how someone like, you know, just tell us about your experience and how you teach your, your 
your especially your parents that you work with to be the parent that they are here to be rather than this book of like oh this is how i need to be i should be this way yeah i think every parent who has a child who's diagnosed with something that they might initially view as an obstacle or a handicap goes through a phase of blaming themselves mm-hmm. and wondering what did i do wrong what did i do that wasn't enough i certainly was somebody who wanted to get parenthood right if that makes sense i had my babies at home with a midwife. I didn't use any drugs during labor. I breastfed. I went to the organic farm to buy produce to make their food. You name it. I didn't give them TV. I I really was so focused on trying to do it right. And when my son was diagnosed, I had kind of a reckoning with myself because at first I was very caught up in the energy of what did I do wrong? I messed up. I was supposed to have this trajectory and that's not where my life is going what did I do wrong to precipitate this? And thankfully, I have spiritual tools and teachers. And it didn't take me long to realize these thoughts do not serve me. They're not helping me in my life. They're not helping me be better for my child. So it's time to let them go, maybe forgive myself for any mistakes that I think I might have made along the way, and really allow myself to be present because that's when I was able to see what a beautiful child I have, what beautiful children I have. And I was missing out on that because I was so caught up in my worry about doing things correctly or being judged by other people for not doing things correctly. And when I let that go, I've really been able to embrace what a great life I have and what a great child I have, though he's different from other people. And I'm really thankful that I had the tools and that's why I'm writing my book truthfully, because I see so many parents of special children caught in that and in the lower frequency thoughts and vibrations and energies of blame and shame and worry and fear. And it doesn't serve their children. It doesn't serve them. Just yesterday for my own podcast, I was interviewing a wonderful health expert in Casper Schultz and he is the founder of an integrative medicine practice. And he was saying that his mother is a developmental psychologist and they have her consult on so many cases because even if you're ticking the boxes, you're going to the gym, you're eating the right foods, you're bringing your child to the holistic doctor, you're giving them the right foods and supplements. If you're walking around with those heavy vibrational thoughts of blame and fear and worry, your child feels that. It doesn't matter how organic their food is. If they're picking up on that energy from you all the time, it doesn't matter what your level of physical fitness is. They're going to learn from that energy. So what do you need to do as a parent, as a human for yourself to take your energy into a more centered place so that you can be more present fully and allow your energy to operate in a higher state of being because that's when you can really be there for them and be in a state of gratitude for what's all around you, which you might not be seeing because you're so caught up in what you don't have. Yeah, so beautifully said, Sarah. I want to highlight a few things that you mentioned. I'm very busy taking notes as you talk (laughs) because they are so amazing, such amazing nuggets. You know, this is a struggle I see with so many of my clients that, you know, what can you do for yourself? And whether you have a unique being that you're parenting or not, every child is so unique. Like I, my, my, my children are, they follow the norm, but one of my, one of my children, my daughter, who's four, she can push my buttons so much because she's such a unique being. And and this 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 concept of like how can you what can you do for yourself now i see people struggle with that and i've struggled with it because i'm like oh you know every free moment i have to spend with them i have to do this and i have to do that and i have to like exactly what you said like i have to cook them the best quality food and how do you work what what do you do with parents that you're working with when they struggle with that One of the things I always remind myself and I always remind them is that 
you can't think your way through this. Nothing is going to make you feel as calm and as centered as your spiritual practices are going to make you feel. So you can get on your mat and try to stall by asking me all these questions and ruminating on all the things you should be doing instead and trying to strategize your day, your week, your month, your quarter, whatever. But really, if you just zip it and do your practices, all the answers you need will be on the other side of that practice. So what's possible for you if you stop the chatter? And you have to really pattern interrupt sometimes because it can feel like you are just on a moving freight train and you're in it. And you're going to have to choose to jump off that train and stop for a moment, at least maybe for an hour, maybe for two hours to allow the answers to come through you. And on the other side of my own yoga and meditation practices, I always describe the feeling that I have as feeling incredibly alive and not at all frenetic, totally centered. But there's a sense of aliveness that I feel that has been able to come through me because I turned off the noise and chose to breathe and focus my energy within. And I never question how I feel on the other side of that. I never question, did I learn what I was supposed to learn today? Or will my decisions the rest of the day be the right ones? Because I always have such a deep inner trust. And this is truthfully why I still practice. There's nothing convenient for me at this point about getting up at the crack of dawn, putting my mat down, practicing my yoga and meditation for combined at least two hours a day. There's nothing convenient about that. But for me, that's what it takes most days for me to be quiet in my mind so that I can be my best self the rest of the day when I'm actually with my children or in my business or both. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I love that. It's not convenient. And yet no. we all have a choice to choose what is going to serve us versus what's not going to serve us. Yes. And everyone is different. I think if you have a good yoga teacher, and if you don't, please feel free to contact me, Sarah at sarayoga.com. You will work with your teacher to build a practice that is unique for your needs. I always joke that my mom is the person who can wake up in the morning, take a walk and do yoga or meditation for five or 10 minutes. And she's good. She doesn't need as much quiet in her mind because she's already pretty quiet. Whereas I'm the person who wakes up in the morning and some mornings I, I used to wake up like this all the time. Now it's less, but still there. Sometimes I wake up and before my feet are even on the floor, I have the, I'm not good enough thoughts. The, how am I going to handle this thoughts? Trying to fix everything for everyone, trying to strategize everything to be perfect. And I know myself well enough now to say, just stop it. Get on your mat. The answers will be there for you on the other side. It doesn't matter how much you sit here with your journal, Sarah, and drink cups of tea and write. That's not going to quiet the chatter for you. Maybe for some people it does. And that's great. But I think working with a teacher, a spiritual teacher who is willing to see your unique needs and not make you like a cookie cutter version of anyone else is really key because there's no one right way to get quiet and to calm your nervous system and to heal. Everyone is different. And that's why I love to work with people one-on-one -on -one because it allows me to see their uniqueness and what they actually need to thrive instead of what's happening to be on Zoom yoga today. Love it. You're really inspiring me. And I'm noticing as you're talking, right? And reflecting back and going, oh, wow. I do wake up early, but I've spent my time more in chatter rather than just doing my practices and creating more silence. And it's really inspiring me to go, okay, what stopped me and what can I do starting now to create that silence? So it's very I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it, I, I love what you said. Like everything is on the other side of your of your practice, whatever that looks like for you. And you just have to do it. It's not convenient. It will probably not be convenient, but you just do it. Yeah. 
there are times where I have to have boundaries in my life too. Like if it's the evening and I'm feeling like the day was really intense and I'm not my most centered at that point, when my husband comes to me and needs to discuss with me something really important about the kids or a big life decision, I know myself well enough to say, honey, I love you. I am not in the best place to have this conversation right now. And I want to be. So can we table this? Because I'm always a different person after a good night of sleep and after my yoga practice. So tomorrow morning after my practice, I'm full on ready for this, but I can't right now. And knowing myself enough to know when I need my practices to help me and making it okay that some other things just have to wait sometimes. There's no harm in waiting. We don't need to solve the world's problems right this minute. It's okay to wait and care for yourself first. Oh, I love that. Setting boundaries for your own self, whether it's with your own self or with others about what your needs are. Absolutely. So Sarah, I'm curious also, you know, can you tell us a little bit about when, when you found out about Rocco's diagnosis? Like, how did you work with that, that time period? And what helped you get to the other side? Like, it's almost like you're on the other side right now. At least that's how I see you. And I'm sure you yes. have days. But um, something, uh, that journey, like it's been a 10-year journey. It's been a 10-year journey. And thank God I had 10 years of yoga practice, of daily yoga practice and yoga sutra study and meditation before that happened, more than 10 years. And I remember this is a beautiful example of how conditioning takes over because when Rocco was in the process of becoming diagnosed, there's a lot of red tape to go through. There's a lot of paperwork to fill out. There's a lot of waiting for the right psychologist to do the testing. There's a lot of waiting for the results. The waiting, I think, is almost worse than the diagnosis itself because your mind is so free to wander. You don't have any answers. And I remember I had a two-year-old and a six-month-old, and I would wake up in the morning, nurse my baby tuck her back into bed. And every cell in my body wanted to go back into bed myself and pull the covers over my head and not face the day because it seemed so intimidating, so unknown. I was dealing with a world I had no idea of before. This was all new to me and scary. And I didn't know how to ask for support at that time because it was unfamiliar to everyone else in my life as well. So thankfully, after I would nurse my baby, put her back to bed, it would be about six o'clock in the morning. And one of my dear friends who was also a yoga teacher would say, Hey, I'll be at the studio for practice. Are you going to come and do your practice with me this morning in the quiet? And I said, yeah, I'll be there. And I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay in bed and hide all day. And yet I got in the car and I went and I did my practice. And on the other side of it, I would cry some days and other days not. And my friend would give me a hug and I would go home and I would feel like I could handle the day. And I really feel that my 10 years of daily practice had conditioned me enough to trust that just do your practice. You don't want to. It may not be your most joyful practice ever, but you will feel different on the other side. It will give you what you need to handle this. And it did every single day without fail. And I had moments of overwhelm, certainly, but that was how I got through it. And I think in a way, my son's diagnosis got me back to my studies in India much faster because it was my form of therapy. Mm -hmm. And my husband knew it was my form of therapy. And it was scary to leave my family at home. I'd always envisioned them coming with me. But my husband said, you need this. You need to go. I knew I needed it. And I went and I healed. And I came home so much stronger. So part of it was very much putting one foot in front of the other, practicing what I preach to my students, trusting that these practices work for me. I had 10 years of evidence that they worked. Just keep trusting them. Just keep doing it. And giving myself grace for it to be messy sometimes and for it to not be perfect, but still doing it. And now, fast forward many years I go back in time in my mind, sometimes to my young 30-year-old self who had two young children and was going through this. And I pat myself on the back and I'm like, damn girl, you did a really good job just showing up for yourself every day when 
you didn't have any answers at all, but you knew you needed to care for yourself. So bravo, because that was enough to get me through that time. And certainly on the other side of that, so much has changed and blossomed, but I'm really thankful that I knew I had to care for myself in order to survive that time, which was a traumatic event in my life. And now that I've healed that, I really feel it's my duty to help other people who are going through that because these simple tools do work, but you have to make time to do them. But when you do, so much is possible for you. Wow, Sarah, it's incredible. I'm almost choking up just picturing how you you did this and that you're such an example of courage and focus on just, okay, one step at a time. And that one, it's almost like one practice a day, like a, a time is what helped you get through it. It is. And I also want to say that at that time, I did not think I was doing anything special. I didn't think, wow, this is going to change the whole trajectory of your life, Sarah, go to your practice. No, it was more like, what do I need to get through the day? What's going to help me get through the day? Yoga. Okay, just do that. When yoga's over, have some breakfast, and then do the next thing, whatever that is. It was really very much one breath at a time, one daily practice at a time. There was no strategy of this being the thing that was going to save my sanity. But I knew in that moment, it was just what I needed. So my advice to you, if you're going through something, everyone has their version of this, by the way, in their right. lives. I've taught yoga to people who have credit card debt. I've taught yoga to people who live in $50 million beach houses. The, it doesn't matter. Everyone has something in their life that they're going through, some trauma they're trying to heal. And what if you truly caring for yourself is the thing that's going to help you, whether it be your child being diagnosed with a learning disability or you on a weight loss journey for your health and it feels urgent and scary and hard. What if you doing that thing to care for your nervous system is enough today? Yeah. And what you said was it saved your, your life or if I'm it paraphrasing, did. but you're also did. saving so many other parents' lives right now through that experience. Yeah. And you know what, like I said, that was not the plan. I remember when my son was first diagnosed at this time, people in my life were telling me already, you should write a book for other parents, which I'm doing now, nine years later, you should coach other parents through this. And I thought, no, 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 no. First of all, this is not the path that I wanted. And I was grieving that. Second of all, I was keenly aware I had my own healing to do. My plate was full. I had two babies. I just wanted to get through the day and eventually grow my business, share my passions with more people. But I just had to take it one day at a time. So my intention was selfish in a way, just to help myself. But by helping myself, I'm able to set an example for more people. I'm able to share these tools with people and prove to them this really does work. Trust me. I know I've been there. So it's allowed me to be supportive and relatable with people who are in this place now. And they believe me when I tell them this will help you because I've seen it, I've experienced it. So it wasn't the plan for me to use my journey to help other people. But when I started feeling that calling years later, I knew it was my dharma. I couldn't ignore it because it felt like a beautiful spiritual obligation to pass this on. And that's really what my whole life is about now. It's incredible. So being selfish is not really being selfish, is it? <laughs> At the time, I knew it was both being selfish and not being selfish because I was also aware that if I was not selfish enough to do that, everything was going to fall apart. I think many mothers especially are the glue of the family, whether they want to be or not. And I felt, I felt pressure to keep everyone else together at this time that was really intense. And I knew the only way for me to do that was to care for myself. So I did that knowing this is selfish, but it's also not at all because if I come unglued, 
and I'm losing my temper all the time and I'm crying all the time and I can't get out of bed, no one else in my family is going to thrive. So what do I need to do for myself today to get to that place where I can have more to give? And that was the goal. That was the only goal. And I'm thankful that it served me. I'm thankful that now I can pass it on and I have the awareness and the energy to pass it on. But for all of you listening who feel like caring for yourselves is selfish, what I want you to know is that caring for yourself is the thing that's going to help everyone else in your life more than the money you make, more than the dinner you cook, more than anything else. It's going to make the biggest impact. Yes. And I really want to highlight that, Sarah. It's so true and so important. And so many of my clients struggle with putting themselves first. And by doing that simple act, it's actually the most powerful act for the whole family and for themselves. Yes. Everybody wins. Yeah. Yeah. And you also traveled to India during that time, like even after you know, with all of these things happening and you went for weeks on end, I assume, right? Yes. Yes. For a month at a time. And I look back in time and think, wow, that was ballsy of me because <laughs> my kids were really little my first trip back. But that first trip back when I left home an almost three-year-old and a 15-month-old with my husband and my nanny, who I love and value so much, it for me was very much to support my mental health. And it was my form of therapy, as I said before. And other people benefit from being on the therapist's couch. I benefit from being in India with my guru. And I knew that about myself already before I became a mother. And I knew it would help me again. I knew if anything would, this would. And I mentally talked myself through it by saying, just go to India and stay for one week with your guru and tell him the truth about what's going on in your life. That way, in case you have to leave in the middle of the night to get home one day, he'll know that you weren't just doing it to blow off your practice. There are people there who need you. So I FaceTimed every single day, at least once, sometimes twice. I would check in with my family at the end of every week and say, how are you doing today? Do you need me to come home? And everyone was okay. So I would stay another week. And there were moments that felt really hard and scary to be away from them. And there were moments that felt necessary, like I could finally exhale. And at the end of that first month, I've since done it five more times, or six more times. I came home and nothing bothered me anymore. Nothing rattled me. I could get phone calls from the district about my son's services. I could go to the doctor's appointments. Nothing intimidated me anymore. I felt so present and so confident in myself and that I was stronger than I really thought I was. That I, I my attitude was just bring it on. Whatever I need to do today, I'm going to do. I can handle this. I'm strong enough. I'm good enough. And I really attribute that to my spiritual practice, helping me get through all of that mental chatter that was in the way and connect to who I really am. And that's all it was. I don't say that lightly. That's all it was. It was not complicated. I think sometimes we look for the big complicated solution as humans. And yet what's possible if you just put your mat down, put your meditation cushion down, do the thing, stop procrastinating. Stop listening to the chatter and just stop doing all of those things that don't serve you. Do the one thing that does serve you. How will you feel on the other side of that? How will you feel on the other side of doing that for 30 days or 30 years? You yeah. Know? yeah. It, it all starts with one day. Just do today. Yeah. And exactly what you're saying, Sarah, imagine what's possible, right? Like by prioritizing yeah. yourself one day at a time, one practice at a time, one breath at a time, imagine what's possible. And that's exactly what you showed yourself and showed everyone around you. And now you're using that to help so many more parents. I'm honored that I can help. I'm thankful that I can help. And truly humbled because 
I don't like to use the word just, but I just think of myself as a yoga practitioner. I'm just someone who's been doing this day after day for 20 years. There's both nothing special about it. It's just a practice. You just do it. And there's so many things special about it because the result is cumulative, but I still wake up in the morning and some days I'm excited to do my practice and other days not, but I still do it anyway because I know it will help me. So I think removing the space for negotiation with yourself, most people, when they have at least a little experience with a spiritual practice, are very aware that they need it. They don't question that they need it or not. So what's possible for you if you just trust that you need it and then do it? Instead of trusting that you need it, but negotiate with yourself, oh, I don't need to, or this other thing might be more important, or that's not as important today. I should do my accounting and my business instead, blah, blah, blah. What if you just trust that you need it and honor it and let that be enough? I love that. Trust and honor it and let that be enough. And what you also said, I wanted to highlight that. It's like literally one week at a time. You know, like that's a yeah. beautiful example. You just checked in with your family one week at a time, right? And that's all it takes. Yeah. And then that one week leads to one month and then one year and then 10 years. Exactly. It's really exactly. incredible. As I'm now nearing my 20 years of daily practice, it doesn't feel like it's been that long because it's literally just one day at a time. Yes. Yes. And in my, in my first days, I was in my college dorm room practicing next to a book and looking at the pictures as I did it because I didn't have a teacher who lived near me. And now, 20 years later, I've taken 10 extended trips of study to India. I have a guru who I learned from. I'm disciplined. I'm devoted. And I'm still a student and I'm still learning just like that person on day one. That's amazing. It's an evolving journey. That's really amazing. I just invite all our listeners to take notes and share, put it to practice. Like, you know, like we all know this, it's not just about knowing this information or understanding this. It's about taking action and putting it to practice, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes, like you said, the practice looks different for everyone. But the answers lie on the other side of the practice. Like, I love that. I really, I think that's so powerful. Yes. And your practice, if you have a teacher who's knowledgeable, will probably change at different points in your life. It's never going to be the same thing always. And there are times where it's up to you to pour your energy into your practice because that's what you need. And there are times where you have to do your bare minimum because your child is sick or because you're moving house and it's a lot of responsibility but your bare minimum will still give something to you. And remembering that the result is cumulative, it all adds up in the end. So just doing whatever you need today, whatever is appropriate for you today and allowing that to be enough. Beautiful. So beautifully said, Sarah. So share with us how people can work with you and where they can find you. Sure. I because I have two businesses, one for my yoga and wellness business and one for my consulting practice for autism and special needs families, I'll give you both. So Sarah Yoga, S-A-R-A, is my website where you can message me and look at all things yoga related. You can also find me on Instagram, Sarah Intonato Yoga. And the best place to find me right now for my autism related work is also on Instagram, Sarah dot intonato. And I have lots of free resources there for families who are just starting out and wanting to improve their situation. So I'm always sharing, whether it be through my podcast or resources, don't be shy about reaching out and asking for what you need as well. Beautiful. I'm going to include all of that in the show notes. Um, also share with us about your podcast. I know you have two, which, what, whichever ones you want to share or both. Sure. My Ancient Wisdom for the Modern Wellness Professional podcast is a podcast for yoga teachers and healers who are growing their businesses and maybe hitting some roadblocks along the way or just wanting to grow their business in a way that feels authentic to them rather than corporate And I also have a new podcast that's only a couple of weeks old called Full Potential Thriving with Autism. And it is for families both with autism and other types of 
neurodiverse diverse diagnoses, ADHD, sensory processing, et cetera. And it's a resource that highlights health, advocacy, how to care for yourself as a parent of a unique child, which is a different parenting journey than parenting a neurotypical child. And it's full of so much information that can help you on a day-to-day basis, both in your self-care habits and also in your work with your child. So please find and listen to it, share it. Everyone these days, if they don't have a unique child, knows somebody who does. So I encourage you to share it with the people in your life who need support in that area, because I do find that with this particular population, the parents feel very alone, very isolated. They're fearing judgment, like people will assume they're not good parents because their child is different. So it's really important that we get this population supported and moving into a place where they can thrive as parents, as whole families. So that's my goal with that podcast. So thank you so much for listening. And please don't be shy about contacting me, whether through social or email in whatever way feels good for you, because I love forming real relationships. And it's always, it always is exciting for me when people who listen to a podcast episode have a real face and a real personality and I get to meet them or talk to them and it makes me really happy. So please don't be shy. Reach out if you feel called. I thank you so much, Sarah. That's amazing. I will share all the all the all the ways people can reach you in the show notes. So yes, I, I love that. And uh, thank you for your time and your wisdom and thank you your for energy. Me. It's so such a pleasure, such a pleasure to have chatted with you today. The pleasure is mine. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you for listening. <laughs>